So I, I woke up today and I looked in the mirror, and that's always a mistake. <laughs> and I said, you start, you know you're getting old when your wrinkles have wrinkles. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how I started my day to day. And I, Gary talks about getting sick to his stomach every time he's going to preach. And, um, and uh, I don't get sick to my stomach, but I do get nervous. I do get nervous. I remember my dad telling me he's an orthopedic surgeon, and he said, if you've been off uh, away from surgery for uh, uh, a month or so, he said the first cut was always really nerve wracking. He had to cut again. So uh, I don't preach very often, I'm filling in for Gary. And, uh, and uh, um, it, uh, I've done it enough that I, I know I've been through it. <laughs> so um, I want to talk to you today about probably the most, second most important thing, first and most important thing after accepting Christ. Gary talked about forgiveness uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and he stole my thunder. I was, I had, had been, I thought this was a message for the household of God for a long time. And I just, I wanted to share a slightly different perspective on it, uh, same truth but a different perspective. And um, I'll t start with a story. I, I was a pastor in the Presbyterian Church up in a Grove City, Pennsylvania. Uh, there was a woman there in the hospital. And she was dying of cancer. And uh, her husband, who had been unfaithful, I guess quite often, came in into her uh, room. And I was there with her. And he was um, trying to comfort, console, say he was sorry, I guess. And so he reached out to touch her. And she went like that. Honestly, not forgiving. In bitterness. So I, um, I was reading some studies. I don't know if you want to put that uh, um, medical study up. Anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness can lead to health problems. That does not mean that all cancers are related to unforgiveness. All sicknesses are related to unforgiveness. However, I have seen people being healed from their sicknesses and diseases after they have entered into forgiveness of people. Because it releases toxins in your system, it cre creates a kind of pattern of mm, uh, depression and bitterness. Go ahead and put the rest up. I want to read this. It's, it's classified as the medical in medical books as a disease. And according to do Dr. Stephen Sandiford, chief of surgery at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, refusing to forgive people makes people sick, sick, and keeps them that way. Next. It's important to treat emotional wounds as a quote from him or disorders because they can hinder someone's reactions to treatment, even someone's willingness to pursue treatment. Of all cancer patients, 61% have forgiveness issues, and of those, more than half are severe. Harboring these negative emotions, this anger and hatred creates a state of chronic anxiety. Chronic anxiety very predictably produces excess adrenaline and cortisol, which deplete the production of natural killer cells, which is your body's foot soldier in the fight against cancer. Feeling bitter interferes with the body's hormonal and immune systems. Studies have shown that bitter, angry people have higher blood pressure and heart rate and are more likely to die of heart disease and other illnesses. One of the hardest things is to try and forgive Oh, that's the next section. Sorry, that's the quote. That's the, they can you keep that up. So um, forgiveness is part of our necessary pattern to, to be, be healed emotionally and spiritually. Uh, and there is so much that um, is involved with this. So um, I just wanted to bring this out. I, I found this out to be true in me. The carrying offenses for others can be one of the most hardest, hardest things to, to forgive. It's one thing to forgive something that's done to you personally, but if something's done to your child or to someone you care about, then forgiving that person who's done that to somebody else is hard. And you find that you are carrying unforgiveness for what was done to someone else. Now that is um, we don't recognize that, our, that we need to forgive sometimes when it's done. We're, we're trying to protect someone else or we're trying to get justice for someone else. So I just want to make you aware of that. This, I'm gonna, what I'm going to say today is probably going to bring up memories.
memories, thoughts of people, and feelings that you have had or harbored in your life. And so what I'm saying to you is the Holy Spirit is now reminding you of things that the Lord is trying to deal with in your life. Okay? So if you get mad, upset, or frustrated, just remember, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> It's the Lord who's dealing with your heart. <laughs> Next thing to know, and this is probably the key to getting over unforgiveness, that forgiveness is an act of the will. It's not an act, uh, an act of your emotions. I don't know how I learned this, but I've experienced it over time, that when I forgive someone, I, by a, an act of my will, I choose to forgive them, uh, then my emotions get cleaned up afterwards. I don't feel release or relief until after I've forgiven them. I don't ever feel like I want to forgive them. Right? If someone does something bad to you, the first thing you want to do is clock them. You don't want to forgive them. That's normal, that's natural, that's an, it, it, our, our human emotions, but we are not required or called by God to live in our emotions. We're called to live in obedience. So I, I'm going to show you a pattern of forgiving that I've used, um, and I'll, I'll talk about it again at the end. But it is a simple choice of, Lord, this person has done this to me. I choose, because you have commanded me to, I forgive them. And I'll put the person's name in, and I'll release them to your care. And once I do that, I may not feel any different right away, but the Lord will begin to work on my heart and release me from the bitterness, anger, uh, rejection, whatever it is that I've been experiencing in my life in relation to that person and to what they did to me. So, uh, would you put up Matthew, uh, Joe? And, uh, Andrew, would you read this for us? Sure. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. That same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and besought him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison, that he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their lord all that had taken place. Then his lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you besought me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servants as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his lord delivered him to the jailers, that he should pay all his debt. So also my Heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Okay, so <clears throat> there's some doctrines out there called once saved, always saved. And this is not about that. This is about, I don't want to be, oh, would you leave that last one up for, for, for a minute, Joe? The last, yeah. I don't want to be on the other side of unforgiveness and face the Lord. Because he said, the Heavenly Father will do to me if I don't forgive my brother from my heart. I don't want to be put in a position where I'm trying to justify myself why I didn't forgive someone and because whatever they did to me, and God said, I'm not going to forgive you. I don't want to be there. I don't want you, but I don't want to be there. Now, one of the interesting words in here is jailers. And uh, some translators use tormentors, but the and some use tortures. The Greek word is uh, basanistas, and it means a prison guard, a jailer who tortures. So 
The idea is that if you do not forgive, you will be given over to torture, torment. And I, in, in our lifetime, before the judgment, if we do not forgive, we, are, if we enter torment in our minds. There is this unsatisfying feelings inside our heart. We are tormented by the memories of what has taken place in our life. We are not over it. We're not past it. We may cope with it, but we have not been released from it. And as long as we've not been released from it, we are in torment. We are in torture. Now, I don't want to even get to the end of my life and have to be there forever. I just want to get rid of it now. So, um, I want to tell you a little about my story. Um, you, some of you know some part of this, and, and I've repeated it before. Uh, I was kicked out of a Presbyterian church in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was pro-life. I sat down in front of an abortion clinic uh, peacefully. I was arrested. I don't know how the church found out about it because I never told anybody. I never tried to push anything on anybody. But the Lord had asked me to go do this, so I was obeying. And by the time I got home, I was in jail for like a couple hours. Uh, the church had already found out about it and they wanted me out. Uh, and, and the presbytery was more interested in this than they were in righteousness and they wanted, it's, it's more expedient for one man to be kicked out of the church and then to lose all the money that might come in from that location. Didn't matter whether that was righteous or not. It was just a matter of politics. So, uh, I... Uh, uh, not that day, but soon after, I began to forgive the people for having rejected what the Lord was doing. Now, it wasn't, I think what happened was that was just an excuse to get rid of me because I was very evangelical and this was what I call more of a social club church. And I had one uh, old time uh, elder in the church come up to me and start poking me in the chest and stop talking about that first relationship with Jesus stuff. That's two Methodists. And uh, so, you know, you can tell the drunk shaky ground when the elder of the church says you should stop talking about that. And uh, by the way, at the end of his life, we became friends. Uh, and uh, so God could work grace and miracles. And unfortunately, his brother, who was on the other side, who was supporting me, originally turned against me. So you never know who's going to be uh, faithful to the end. However, um, I, I forgave the people of their, the, their sins. Then I we planted another church, and it, it went pretty well. It was a small church, but it turned out to be a mission church to a small community in a trailer park. And it was a low-income community. And uh, uh, it was a small group of people, and a lot of them were formerly abused and dysfunctional, as you might imagine not being able to deal with authority, even as gentle as I was. <laughs> you know, could not take any kind of direction or correction. And uh, after five years of a very effective ministry, we led 26 people to the Lord. We kind of, they got burned out as all the ministry and everything uh, and gave it over to a Baptist ministry. So I got out of there and I was a little uh, disheartened that the, that, um, the cloud of glory had not shown and the earth had not parted and the waters uh, parted and everything and, and the Lord hadn't shown up and created a big church. But that was my expectation, not his. You know? It was a mission outreach. It wasn't a, to build a new church um, like Cypress Creek down the street. You know, it was, that wasn't his call. I didn't realize it at the time. Anyway, the Lord taught me a lot through this. However, I felt from both the first occasion and church and the second, a kind of bitterness in my heart. Just this nagging sense of, of bitterness, disappointment, partly in, in the Lord, I thought, partly in, in what, you know, what happened in my life, what was I doing, what mistakes did I made, why did I screw up so bad, you know, what, why was this a failure? It wasn't, but it you know, felt like it. And so, um, I met a ministry, uh, a friend in his ministry up in Erie, and he talked about the difference between forgiving people and forgiving their sins. You put up John there. John 20, 23 says, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, 
they are forgiven them. But if you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Another translation says if you remit the sins, uh, uh, they are remitted. If you don't remit them, they're, they're, not, they're withheld. Remittance and forgiveness are similar, not exactly the same, but close enough. And um, uh, what, what the, the, he taught me was that a lot of times we have been sinned against. We forgive the people, but we have not forgiven the things that they have done to us. Thinking that that's the same thing. So I had to go through a catalog of the things that had been done to me over 10 years to start recognizing that what it was that was actually sinful about what some of the people had done towards me. Some had been involved in the occult. Some refused to take correction and would undermine my ministry. And so I had, to, I had already forgiven them as people, but the bitterness had gone away. And I had to start forgiving the actions that they had done. And when I forgave the actions that they had done, the bitterness left. My confidence in the Lord and my future rose. Now, that doesn't happen when I watch the news like this in the morning or in the evening. You know, my confidence is like, a phew. Um, and I have to enter into forgiveness on a daily basis. But, but in, in terms of the, my calling and direction in life, um, uh, first of all, I love this church because most people here had been kicked out of someplace else or beaten up somehow. And the, the, and the, 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 their agendas have been beaten out of them. We don't have an agenda to try and manipulate, control, be in charge of this and that. Because we've already been there and done that. And it did not work in our favor. Uh, and it has it used, been used against us. So there is a gentleness in this church that I don't... This is probably the healthiest church I've ever been associated with. Amen. And, and that's because you all are like me. You, you experience rejection and, 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 and things like that. And you don't care what the color of the carpet is. <laughs> you're, you're more interested in the person next to you in the queue who's hurting. And I, I, that's, uh, that is a, a beautiful thing. Gary's mentioned that often. I just I agree with it. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't like that. Um, so, uh, when you forgive someone, and let's say they have done something like you know, spoken a bad word about you behind your back, find out about it. First of all, you forgive them for being jerks. And then you forgive them. <laughs> forgive them what they said about you, what they did, which is betrayal, right? So you forgive the person and you forgive the sin. It's important. Now, this is really important when dealing with abuse. There's a difference between excusing versus forgiving. And I, in dealing with a lot of people who, in my churches who have been abused, it is, I find that there's a pattern of making excuses for the person. This is talking about sexual and emotional abuse, physical abuse. Especially if they're close to you and a loved one or, or a parent or something like that. You, tend, you may have a tendency to blame yourself for what happened. That is not forgiveness. That is excusing the behavior and the sin that was done against you. It's important to realize that in order to forgive someone of what they've done to you, you have to recognize it and acknowledge it that it was a sin. It was evil against you. Because you cannot forgive someone you excuse for their, their behavior. You have to, the only thing you can forgive is when they have done something that is wrong towards you. And this is an important thing that is a distinction. Now, um, I find that one of the problems is that, that people think they shouldn't be angry about what is done to them. And I find that if people, especially who have been sexually, emotionally, physically abused, unless they get angry about what happened to them in the past, they can't get to the point where they're willing to forgive. Because if they're not angry about what took place, they are excusing that behavior that they've done to them. They're not recognizing that it was a violation of their person and a sin against them. So this is, um, Paul said, to be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. What he's saying is if you don't get angry and let it out, 
and you harbor it for years and years and years and years, you are making room for the devil in your heart. The bitterness is there. The uh, unresolved issues are still there. The unforgiveness is still there. So being angry is an appropriate response to violation. And uh, this is like, you know, if you're, if you're an old wound and you're being uncovered, it's obviously going to be uncomfortable. And you don't have to deal with it today or with here, but you can take it outside and scream at the, at the sun if you want to. But at some point, you've got to recognize and acknowledge and own what was happened to you was wrong. It's a vital step for entering into forgiveness. The next part, the forgiveness is not reconciliation. This is important. Would you put up Matthew 18? And Amanda, would you read it again? No. I don't know how many of those I have out there. Okay, so it does not mean trust is reestablished unless the behavior changes. This is important. Forgiveness is not like closing your eyes and oh, let's be best friends. It is recognizing you need to forgive someone for the things that they've done to you, but you are not reconciled to them unless they acknowledge that what was done to you is wrong and they are repentant and, and the behavior changes. Uh, it's like a wife who's been physically abused, her husband says, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and I won't do it again, and she goes back into the house and he beats her again. That is not reconciliation, and that's not smart, it's not forgiveness, it is um, excusing the behavior. Uh, forgiveness does not depend upon their apology, however, or recognition of wrong. Forgiveness is in your power to do. It is your ability to do, respond to a situation of unfairness and injustice that no one can take away from you, but you have the right and the ability to forgive someone who does something wrong to you. You don't have the ability to change their behavior. You cannot force them to be reconciled or admit that they, what they've done is wrong, but you can forgive them. And you are required by God to forgive them for your sake. It is for your sake. If you harbor hostility and unforgiveness in your heart, it's you that relive the past over and over again. You'll have that memory, or that memory comes up and it just, it's just like fire in your brain. Or horse fly in your neck by you. It just keeps coming back and coming back. That's a sign that you have not released the past. You have not forgiven. Reconciliation requires the other party to recognize the wrong and ask for forgiveness. If you do not see that in their behavior, you can forgive them, but you are not reconciled. And I wouldn't trust them. Trust depends upon reconciliation. It does not depend on forgiveness. Forgiveness can be given without trust being reestablished. And that's why people get confused, thinking, well, now that I've forgiven them, now I have to pretend like nothing ever happened. No. If they come and repent, and it's true and genuine, and the behavior changes, yes, then forgiveness will end in reconciliation. But it doesn't always do so. Now we put up Matthew. Matthew 18, 15 through 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Jesus' goal is for us to be reconciled to one another. Um, and he gives us a pattern and a process by which we can make friends of our enemies. And that is... If someone has done something, and he's talking about brothers, so he's talking about most of the people inside the church. If they've done something that annoyed you, you can go talk to them. And if they don't listen to you and it's really something serious, take a couple people along with you and say, hey, you know, uh, it's, it's 
stealing my gas is not a Christian thing to do, right? And if they don't listen to you, take it to the church, the whole group. And if they don't listen to you, basically you're not going to be able to be reconciled. It's on their head. You know, it's, it's, it, but the goal is that each, each of those steps is so that they will come to you and you will be reconciled. You'll be able to trust each other again and get along in a really uh, deep way. Um, Boy, it's a little faster than I thought. So, uh, one of the things that I've seen in larger churches is that when people are offended in one another, rather than be reconciled and talk it out and deal with it, is that they can go sit in another pew on the other side of the large church and they never have to deal with that person again. That's not forgiveness. That's not reconciliation. That's avoidance. But it's still not... not true love. One of the difficulties I had in the second church that we planted was that there were four people in, in, in involved in most of the ministries. And uh, they had the exact four opposite personality types. The one was a you know, dynamic in charge, the other person is a uh, uh, sweet servant and everything else. And, and those four people couldn't get along. <laughs> And I said, Lord, if you can't get these four people to get involved in the same ministry to the children, how can you reconcile an entire church? It's a hard thing. But I watched large churches, and where people get offended and they sit their clicks up in different parts of the church, and I know if persecution ever comes, that those churches are going to fall apart. Now, they're coming for the show, they're coming for the entertainment, they're coming for the programs. But they're not walking in love with one another and deeply reconciled. You cannot learn to love someone truly unless you learn to love them with their faults and their mistakes. God's trying to teach us agape love, which is love that is unconditional. So that we would love like Jesus loves, like the Father loves. Which means that we would love each other with our faults, knowing our faults, not just being able to pretend or hide from them. And you don't really get to know someone well and love them for who they are unless you know what kind of faults they have. Lee, <laughs> so tell them. <laughs> She's probably out there. <laughs> you know, but I would say they, when I say the wrong thing, you know, she'll kick me under the table and I'll go, what? What? I'm not, I'm not the most um, uh, sensitive person. You know, I'm, <laughs> I, I sometimes say what I think, whether I, you know, I'm still heavy, you know, <laughs> just say what I say, what, what I shouldn't say it at all, but, uh, and I never know the difference. So that's my issue, but, you know, if you hurt me with the mistakes that I made, then you're really loving me as a person. And she does, you know, she loves me, uh, unbelievably so. But, you know, in, my, in God's mercy, she loves me. So, um, some forgiveness requires daily repetition. And it does not end in reconciliation. I was in working in a food stamp program in Virginia, and there was a woman there uh, who would not do her work. She'd sit back and read romance novels. I mean, seriously. And there are people who were hungry that were not getting this food stamp because she wouldn't do her work. And it went on for, you know, months at a time. And I finally told her, I'm not covering for you anymore. If you don't do your work, I'm telling people you're not doing your work. These are people coming in. Because this is not my responsibility to fix your problems or fix their problems. And, and I can't cover for you. Well, that was, that was, that started a firestorm. Uh, every time she'd walk by my office and she would so snide, mean, snarky remark, you know, bang, bang, bang. It went on over and over and over again for uh, several weeks, maybe a couple months. <laughs> and finally, I just, you know, went out to the office and said, what's the problem? <laughs> you know, I blew up that anger, right? Went into the supervisor's office. Uh, and the supervisor basically, you know, I was clean, you know, she, I hadn't done anything wrong. However, I couldn't reconcile with her. 
Not because I would not want to reconcile with her, but because she would not reconcile. She would not agree to live in harmony with me. I did everything I could. I tried to be patient, tried to be kind, tried to this and that, and finally being angry, and nothing would reconcile her to me. So, there's times in your life when you're going to have people in your life that you cannot, no matter what you do, reconcile. You cannot make them like you. You cannot um, get along with them. You cannot fix the situation. So what do you do? And I had said, I'm, I'm writing this, I was thinking, every time I turn on the news and watch the politics of today, I'm thinking that I'm going to have to work into forgiveness every single day. I have to forgive those who are under the power of darkness, doing things, as Paul said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, we're wrestling against principalities and powers. They're enslaved by darkness, they are operating under the power of darkness, and they are doing things that they think is good, that they think are good, and are not, are attacking Christ and us. And so, do I need to forgive politicians and the media for lying about Jesus and lying about Christianity? Yeah, I have to. And it's going to be required daily. It's not getting any easier. It's getting harder. Um, so, just to put up Romans, uh, would you read this again, Andrew? Romans 12, 16 through 21. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. But associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil. Take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thank you. <clears throat> and I, I thought this phrase, insofar as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. It is not going to be able to be lived peaceably with all. But as far as it is your concern, as it depends upon you. Try. Try to live peacefully with those who hate you and persecute you. Or have been sinned against you. Um, would you put up that book, uh, John? I was reading this this morning and, and last night I was just meditating on this. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And what he's talking about is that we who have Christ in our hearts uh, are part of we're from God. But those who are in the world, not in Christ, are under or lie in the power of, of the evil one. You cannot expect them to behave any other way than the way their master works in their hearts. So rather than expect them to act like good Christians, they, you have to expect them to act like their master, knowing that they're enslaved, and that the best thing we can do for them is forgive them and overcome evil with good. And it's a challenge. I mean, this world is becoming darker and darker, and it is a challenge to operate in kindness and mercy and love towards those who constantly harass, harangue, and persecute and lie about us. But that is what we need to do in order to be free of the bitterness that will come to us if we allow this hostility to reside in our hearts without us entering into daily forgiveness. I'll tell you what, it is very difficult for me because I watch what's going on and I realize that if certain people get elected, They'll be massive. They'll continue to to uh, destroy our Christian liberty, and they will appoint people who continue to support the death of the unborn. And and I know that this is going to and probably I have a friend, a, a pastor, I mentor in other Pennsylvania, 
who's in a battle with the city council right now. Uh, not with the city council itself, but with an a, 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 uh, ordinance being proposed and supported by the gay rights community, PFLAG, which is parents of lesbians and gays, that would require churches to open their bathrooms to both sexes and require all places of business to do the same. And you know, it required the boys to be able to go into the girls' locker room, everything. And so he is standing up against this with other 20 other churches who <coughs> become the um, focal point and the voice. And uh, the, the amount of persecutions arising over this and the false accusations that are coming from this are just horrendous. So it, we have a potential of going into a very dark place of persecution. What do we do? Walk in forgiveness. Walk in love. Walk in kindness to those who abuse us. Rejoice when people say all manner of things against you falsely, or not my name, say for great is your reward in heaven. Rejoicing is a powerful tool in the face of opposition. Now, I'm going to close with this. I want to just lead you through, and you don't have to say this out loud, but you can if you want. If you don't, put the person's name in there. It, it, especially if you're sitting next to me. <laughs> but I'm going to lead you in a way of, of releasing people from the sins that they have committed against you. So, um, you should close your eyes, uh, and I'll just, and you can say after me if you want, Father, in the name of Jesus, I recognize that what was done to me was evil. And you fill in the blank there. And I, I, I forgive this person. Fill up blank. For what they, what they did. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I release them to your care. In Jesus' name. That's all it's required. That's how you forgive someone in a practical way. Your emotions will get cleaned up afterwards. So as the Lord reveals to you and reminds you of people who have offended you in the past, who you've never gotten over it, that is the cue that God is giving you that you need to release them, let them go, and forgive them. Whether they, they recognize that they did you was wrong, whether they turn to repent or not, doesn't matter. But for your sake, forgive them so that that bitterness will leave your heart and you will not live in the past, but you will live with hope towards the future in, in Jesus, what he's going to do in your life. So, amen. 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 That's all I got.